Hello and welcome to today's video. Today I'm going to share with you how to triage a chronic illness. So triage is think about the accident and emergency room. So the, the place where you go if you've got like a life or death injury. When you go in, the nurses and the doctors are going to try and figure out what needs to happen to make sure that you don't die. So they're going to try and figure out what is the what is the order of prior priority of things that need to be done to provide the best care to you. This works really well when you look at uh, an acute illness, you know? So if, if somebody's in a car crash, you know, they come in, they've got a dislocated shoulder, they're covered in scratches, but they can't breathe. The first thing that they need to do is CPR. They need to clear this airway and they need to make sure that the, the, the body can get oxygen to the cells. And then they're going to be like, oh, he's bleeding out. We need to make sure that he doesn't bleed out. They fix that. And then like the dislocated shoulder is there the whole time, but they're like, that's not really important right now. That's not the priority. So I want to take this concept of, of triage and apply it to healing a chronic illness. And I want to give you the first five steps that you need to take. So healing a chronic health problem has dozens of steps, you know, maybe like 50. But you need to know what the first five are. Because if you've missed one of these or if you're not doing these in the right order, then it's the same as in the, in the A&E, right? You're not going to get the results. You're not going to get the healing that you, that you could potentially get. So I'm going to help you figure that out. I'm going to give you the first five steps. I'm going to help walk you through them. And you might be surprised by this. You might be surprised that some of the things that maybe you're focused on a lot are actually not the areas of focus that, that I would generally recommend. So just need to do a little microphone check and just make sure that this is all loud and clear. Then you can hear me. All good? Cool. Perfect. Cool. So that's all good. So step number one, how do we, how do we triage a, a chronic a chronic disease, a chronic health problem. Step one is going to be caloric intake and look, taking a look at your protein intake as well. That's going to be your first step. And that might really surprise you. You know, you might be thinking, what about toxins? What about Lyme disease? What about EBV? What about, what about my gut? What about this and what about that? What about my hormones? And you might be thinking, well, why are we just talk, looking at calories and protein? Like, why is this really important? This is number one on the list. This is the most important thing that I have here on the list. The reason this is so important is Every other thing that you're going to do in in the pursuit of healing costs calories. Every single thing. Anytime you're killing a microbe, anytime you are boosting your immune system, anytime you are detoxing, anytime you do a fast, anytime you do anything, it all costs calories. It all costs resources. And if you don't have enough resources, you don't heal. You just don't. It's, your body can't do it. So that is the first step. We have to make sure your calorie intake is high enough. And you would be amazed, and maybe you wouldn't, because when you think about having like digestive problems, you kind of don't want to eat because you're in discomfort, or you don't know what to eat because you're you're scared that you're going to make the situation worse. But the thing that that is the absolute worst is not eating enough. So making sure that we get food intake high enough. So this is there's like a survival limit, and there's like a thriving healing limit. You know, when we're looking at trying to get you to an abundant state where your body has all the resources that it needs, we could be looking at three thousand calories a day. 3,500 calories a day. That's a lot. That's a lot of food. At a bare minimum for women, you're looking 2,200 calories. For, for a man, 2,500, 2,600. If you're under that, um, I'll tell you just from personal experience and from working with thousands of other people, your body will struggle to heal because lower food intake means lower metabolic rate. Lower metabolic rate means less detox, less stomach acid produced, less digestive enzymes produced, less methylation happening, it slows every single thing down in your body. Your hormones don't get created as quickly. Your body can't process things as quickly. Everything gets messed up if you don't have enough resources. So calories are super important. But I also tacked on protein here. Protein is really important. I think people think about protein as just being like one of the macros, you know, like this is just a source of calories. The thing is, even protein as a concept is not really a good concept because not all proteins are equal. So a protein is a combination of amino acids. And everyone says like, oh, I need my vitamin B to do this. I need my methylfolate to do methylation. I need my vitamin B12. And this is, all, this is all true. The thing is, you need to look at protein and you need to look at the amino acids more like they're like vitamins because they are. They are essential amino acids, which means that they are amino acids that our body cannot create or synthesize itself. And that means they are basically like, they're, they're like vitamins. Like if you don't eat them, your body doesn't have them and it can't work properly. So having a deficiency of an amino acid is just as bad as having an a deficiency of any of the B-complex vitamins, of vitamin D, of, the, of your essential fatty acids, of anything. 
And it's, I would say it's actually even more important because you've got every single, every single uh, tissue in your body needs protein to, re to repair. You, you, you need protein basically for everything, but not just, a, again, people think about protein, they're like, oh yeah, I've got big muscles, like it's bodybuilding. Detoxification costs protein, creating glutathione, glutathione, so you know the primary antioxidant in the human body. What is it made of? Is it made of vitamins? No. Is it made of minerals? No. It's made of three amino acids. Glutamine, glycine, cysteine. These are proteins. So if you don't have protein, you, your body just does not work. So making sure that we have caloric, ideally surplus, and also a surplus of these proteins, but not just protein, specifically the amino acids that your body needs. Generally speaking, so Nancy here in the chat says, eggs have a full amino acid profile. That is true. Any animal product has a full amino acid profile. So anything that comes from the animal kingdom is a, has a full amino acid profile. And it's this is this is what is important. It's not just about eating a certain amount of protein. It's about getting the correct amino acids from that protein. So point number one, calorie intake and protein, both extremely important. Second thing, so once we've got this out of the way, like this is the, the number one priority. We sort this problem out. So if I'm working with a client, like this is usually the list, the order of the list that we'd follow. Caloric intake, number one. Second, so like when I say when I'm working with a client, it's like someone coming into the A&E room and you're like, oh my God, it's a disaster. We need to do everything we can to make sure that they survive. Or in my case, it's like, I need to figure out the changes that we need to implement in this person's life to get them from chronic disease, low quality of life, not feeling very good, symptoms. Even people, like I do work with people that are like afraid they're going to die or they're really malnourished or the symptoms are really bad and they're really like really scared it's like okay what do we do to change this trajectory as quickly as possible step one calorie intake and protein step two remove sensitivities so i am not a fan of eating restricted diets long term but i will say in the short term they're one of the best things you can do to improve quality of life and if you're eating food that you cannot digest it does not help you it just hurts you so if you are eating I'll use, I'll use carbohydrates as an example because a lot of people do lower carb diets or a lot of people transition like to things like carnivore or keto. And it's not that carbs themselves are bad. It, it's not. And trust me, I, I was keto for like five or six years. I, I, I ate a lot of carbs now. And it's not that they're bad. It's if you can't digest them and your body can't utilize them, then they're not healthy for you. And they weren't healthy for me. But they are now because I can, I, can, I can use them. So... If you are eating these foods and you can't break them down, digest them and absorb them. And carbs are a really interesting one because they require two steps of your digestive process. You need amylase, which you secrete from your saliva, but also from your pancreas to break the starch down into a disaccharide molecule. And then you break that disaccharide molecule down into a monosaccharide with maltase, which is a brush border enzyme. If your gut lining is damaged, you know, these little wiggly things in your gut, you've probably seen the activity adverts, you know, you've got the brush border enzymes all the way along these. If they're damaged, you don't have very many of them and you can't digest the food. So what happens? You eat the food, you feel full, your body is your body is doing all of this work to try and extract nutrients from this and you don't break it down fully, you can't digest it and you don't absorb it. So your body wastes loads of energy on trying to get resources from it and then it actually just ends up going undigested, which means it feeds candida and parasites and SIBO. And it's not even the, in this case, it's not even the candida, parasites and SIBO, they're even the bad thing. The bad thing is you don't digest it correctly. So these organisms are opportunistically and adaptively breaking these foods down for you because you can't digest them. So when you have food sensitivities, it's a really good indicator that your body cannot digest that food. So you eating that food is basically useless. It's, it's actually worse than useless. Not only does it not benefit you, it actually puts work on your body. You know, if you feed candida, you feed parasites, you increase your intestinal permeability, candida and these things like they produce alcohol they produce acetaldehyde they produce lipopolysaccharides they produce all of these toxins that then come through they come through the portal hepatic vein system into your liver and they're basically damaging your body they're triggering autoimmune disease they're causing hormone imbalance and blood sugar imbalance they cause gallstones they cause all these different kinds of problems so if you're eating foods that you can't digest you feel really bad when you eat them and it's actually putting more work on your body it's worth noting, this is point number two. If you do not have a calorie surplus first, you cannot be removing these foods. You, it, it's going to do your body more harm to not have enough food than to be overly restrictive. This is why it's step number two. So we need to make sure that you have a calorie surplus. And then we can, if we ideally what we want to do, we want to try and 
modify the diet in a way where we take out the allergens or the foods that you can't digest correctly and place other things in there that you can digest correctly. Step number three ties in really nicely here because we're kind of doing step two and step three at the same time. So we're going to remove sensitivities initially, but a lot of the time people have food sensitivities, not because the food is bad, it's literally just because they can't digest it. So if we can figure out where your body is missing its ability to digest those foods and support it, you can eat those foods again. So step number three is the low-hanging fruit in the gut. So low-hanging fruit is a term, kind of, you can imagine this. Imagine you've got a, a big fruit tree. Are you going to try and climb up the tree and pick all of the fruit at the top when you could just walk up to it and just grab these really juicy fruits that are right in front of your face and it takes almost no effort? What are you going to do? There are some, some people that are like, I'm going to climb all the way to the top of the tree and pick the ones right at the top. I'll be honest, I'm lazy. Uh, you can call it lazy. I'm efficient. You know, I don't want to do extra work if I don't have to. I just want to get the results. So I'll pick the low-hanging fruit. I'll just see the fruit that's right in front of me and just grab it. And what this looks like usually, and especially in the context of the gut, because again, we're, we're trying to work on, so those first two points, caloric intake and protein and removing sensitivities. If we can support your gut, it makes both of those things easy to do. You can get more food intake in, you can digest your proteins better, and your food sensitivities will reduce. Like you will have a, a larger range of foods that you're able to tolerate and them not be allergenic to you. So low-hanging fruit in the gut, we're looking for clear indicators that your body is missing digestive machinery and replacing it. So this generally looks like supporting the five pillars. So this is your stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, and mucosa. You have indicators. Uh, these indicators can be through testing. It can be through functional testing. But these, and more often than not, this is the case. This can just be from symptoms alone. You know, if you've got reflux, if you've got gastritis, if you've got um, gastroparesis, this is a good indicator that you've got a stomach acid issue. If you're constipated, if you're tired all the time, if you have a hard time, especially with like carbohydrates and fibers and things like that, really good likelihood that you're missing digestive enzymes. If you're struggling with fats or if you get full very, very easily, if you know you've got a leaky gut and a lot of uh, toxin exposure, your liver's probably really struggling, your bile is all sticky and congested, it doesn't really work very well, you know? you can see these these symptoms they like obvious like to the right eyes if you look at what's happening in your health situation through the right lens your symptoms mean that they're like obvious indicators of dysfunction so if we just correct that dysfunction so if we support the digestive enzymes we support the 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 stomach acid this is going to depend on where the where the problem is if you support it not only have you now stopped that thing from hurting the body you're now helping it you're actually helping it to be a healing thing and as you do this, the digestive system comes back online and you gain a lot of tolerance to foods. So for example, we use the carbs again. I find a lot of the time, if we can work on healing the gut lining a little bit, usually with probiotics and maybe some other things, and you add some digestive enzymes in there, particularly the amylase and the maltase, which are missing for carbohydrate digestion, a lot of people that, that have it and like they have carbs and they have blood sugar problems or they have like, like systemic like candida or yeast problems, if you digest them correctly, you then absorb them. They don't feed the candida. And then you actually are nourishing your body and you feel good and you get to eat like food again. And it's like, all right, I can have rice. You can have potatoes. You know, John, I made some, some roast potatoes the other day and it was like, oh, they were delicious. Roast potatoes cooked in, in um, pig oil, like super crispy. It was just like the most delicious thing. And like, I can eat it and I can digest it. And it's like, wow, I can eat this delicious food and it makes me strong again. Like no, no reactions, no sensitivities. It's, it's really cool. So pick the low-hanging fruit, especially related to the gut. So it's look for the obvious indicators of gut dysfunction and correct. This is usually with potentially dietary changes. So food combining could be something really interesting, look, interesting to look into here as well. So that doesn't mean you're restricting your diet. It just means you're changing the way that you're eating your foods. So having one meal that's more of a protein focus and another meal that's more of a carb focus, eating fruit separately, for example. We've got a food combining ebook if you're interested. I could send you that. So pick the low-hanging fruit in the gut, that's step number three, and that really supports your calorie intake, protein intake, and your tolerance to food, which reduces your food sensitivity. So it's got this very nice um, positive feedback loop. A lot, of uh, like, a lot of chronic disease happens because we get a negative feedback loop, where one thing means another thing goes wrong, like you don't digest your food correctly, which means you feed SIBO and Candida, and then you get an extra toxins, and then you get nutritional deficiency because you can't digest any of your food. And it's just like, it's wrong. It's going bad. It's worse. It's worse. It's worse. So we're trying to turn that around. So it's like, 
I digest my food again. I'm actually a little bit more happier with my life. I'm feeling less candida. My microbiome's changing. I'm detoxing again. And it just becomes this positive snowball instead. Sorry about that. Got the mic there. So step number four is to optimize sleep and activity. So this is, your sleep is so important. Your sleep is literally when your body is healing. When you are asleep, your body is in the most deep stages of parasympathetic activation. So when you think about fight or everyone, every, I think almost everyone watching this probably knows being in fight or flight is like, especially in, for like a long time, for extended periods of time is not good if you're trying to heal. If you're stuck in sympathetic dominance, if you're stuck in fight or flight, that does not equate to a healing energy. Sympathetic nervous system is important, you know, because if you do get chased by a tiger or you've got a deadline or you've got emotional stress or you've got something, you need to be able to respond. You need to be responsive. But the parasympathetic nervous system is what's really responsible for healing. And if you are asleep and you're getting really good sleep, like long hours, deep, high quality, your body is in a very deep stage of parasympathetic activation. So this means your body is like, it's just flowing in this like really deep healing energy. And you need that. You want to heal from a chronic illness, you need healing energy. And the best way to tap into healing energy is to get parasympathetic activation while you're asleep. So at this stage, we're looking at optimizing the sleep. And this does often tie in with activity. I, I work with people of all different kinds of levels. You know, I, like I personally myself had chronic fatigue syndrome. You come to me and say, you need to improve your sleep and you need to improve your activity. I'd say, fuck off. Like, I can't do anything. I don't have any energy. Like, I will physically destroy my body if I if I try to do any exercise whatsoever. So this is, I'm making a video, you know, but it's always, it's always personalized. You always have to calibrate this to the individual. If you are able to do some activity though, going for a walk first thing in the morning, getting some, some sunlight in your eyes, unbelievably helpful for improving your quality of your sleep. And if you're able to do that and you're not, this is, again, one of these low-hanging fruits that's right in front of your face. You just need to pick it. It's like a really easy thing that you can do. So that looks a bit different for everyone. A good general rule of thumb for improving your quality of sleep, if you aren't using an earthing or a grounding cable, you're absolutely crazy. You're absolutely insane. It costs like $30. It's a one-time investment. Once you have it, you can use it for the rest of your life. It improves the quality of your sleep. It improves the, the oxidative stress load of your body. So it basically floods you with free antioxidants. It improves your circadian balance. It balances your causal rhythms. Honestly, like as far as bang for your buck, like the amount of money that you invest versus the outcome that you get, there is not a single thing that is better than buying a grounding or earthing cable. I have another video about this on YouTube. So you can go on YouTube and type my name, William Dickinson, grounding, earthing, benefits, something like that. And you'll 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 find it. You just go and check out my channel. So that's that's just generally a good rule of thumb for everyone but the other things you know it's never it's never always just like a a simple path to follow you know some people have got medication dependence you know maybe there's some some chronic pains you've been on opiates or something maybe you've got several sleep medications you've been on for a while the thing is sleep medications knock you out they make you fall asleep but they stop your sleep from being restorative so it's figuring this out this is the next chunk of this healing process is figure out how we can optimize your sleep and activity to whatever uh, ability you, you 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 have at that at that current stage so that's step four step five i love this step this step is so important step five a lot of people you probably wouldn't even think about this as being a step but it is step five focus on improving your quality of life healing is a marathon not a sprint you're going to be working on this whatever it is that you're working on you're going to be working on this for years even if you're towards the end of your journey, you know, I've been doing this for nearly a decade. I've been working on healing for 10 years. I know I still have five to 10 years to come. And I'm totally fine with that because my quality of life is so high. At this stage from here, the most important thing we can do is get your quality of life really, really high. And we need to figure out where the quality of life is low and improve it. So if this, if this is chronic pain, we need to improve your chronic pain. If this is social isolation, we need to figure out a way to get you to have social interactions. Whatever it is, whatever it is that is bringing your quality of life down, we need to change it. We need to improve it because we're going to be doing this for a while and we need to make it sustainable. We need to make it enjoyable. I actually enjoy my healing process now. Yeah, I have bad days. You know, I had, I had a really bad day yesterday. It happens. That's normal. That's a part of the process. But my average quality of life is so high that even when I'm having a bad day, I can just very easily say to myself, it's not going to be like this forever. 
you know what you're doing, you know what your average is like, tomorrow will be a better day. And even by the end of the day, I was feeling amazing. So focusing on your quality of life is really important because I, I will, I'll tell you this from firsthand experience. Your life in itself is not valuable. My quality of life was so bad, I basically wished I could die for nearly, probably nearly a year. Just day after day after day of just, I just wish I could, I wish I, wish I could die. So your life itself is not valuable because if your quality of life gets so low, you'll actually ask for your life to be taken away. If you focus on your quality of life, which is what's really important, you know, if you have your quality of life high enough, even if this is taking some time, and I'm promising you it will, it's not going to take forever, but it will take some time. If you can focus on making your quality of life high, you will enjoy the process. You'll be able to move through healing saying, this isn't so bad. I can do this. This is a marathon, but I'm quite happy to keep jogging. And you will get there. So after this, I really would focus on quality of life. And there's a lot of things that I didn't touch on today that might surprise you. We didn't talk about parasites. We didn't talk about um, probiotics, particularly all that much. I mean, there's a little bit of that in working on those low-hanging fruit in the gut. We didn't talk about probiotics that much. We didn't talk at all about hormones. You know, you've got thyroid, adrenal hormones. We didn't talk about nervous system regulation stuff. We didn't talk about emotional root cause. There's a whole bunch of different things that I didn't talk about. And that's by design. Because these are the five most important things. You need to prioritize these. You need to do these in order. So just to recap for you, most important, calorie intake and protein intake. If, you, if, you're, if you're watching this and you're not sure if you're on, on, on track, you can literally track this in a calorie counting app. So you can go on the Play Store or on the App Store, and type macro tracker, track a full day of eating and send it to me. I will review it for you for free. It is so important and I, I just want you to heal. So track a full day, send it over, and I'll give you some feedback. Second, remove sensitivities. I discourage long-term restrictive diets. However, in the short term, having a sensitivity is an indicator that your body cannot process, digest, break down, and absorb that food. So eating it is actually not helping you. It's just adding immune burden. It's adding extra work. It's filling you up, and it's not providing you with any nutrients. No nourishment, no calories, no micronutrients. It's useless. So remove them. But don't just remove them. With that being the end goal, we're going to try and figure out how to get them back into your diet. A lot of that we can do with step three. Focus on the low-hanging fruit, especially in the gut. So figure out what your gut symptoms are telling you and how they are indicating dysfunction in your digestive system. If you don't know how to do that, reach out, ask for help. I'll give you a hand with that. It's really, really important. And it can improve your quality of life very quickly. It can improve your, sim your food tolerance very quickly. There's so much low-hanging fruit in the gut that just doesn't get picked because people don't know what to do. If you don't know what to do, ask me for help and I'll help you. Fourth, optimize sleep and activity. If your activity levels are low, if you have chronic fatigue syndrome, if you have adrenal fatigue, I'm not telling you to go and run a marathon. Literally a 10 to 15 minute walk in the morning, getting some light into your eyes can be really, really helpful. If you can't do that, then don't do it. That's fine. But do improve your sleep as much as you can. Learn about sleep stages. Learn about... Do, do some research on figuring out how you can improve your sleep more. I will say that doing the first three can be really helpful. If your gut's working better, if you've removed a lot of your sensitivities, and if you're eating enough food, really, really helpful in promoting good sleep. And finally, focus on your quality of life. Your quality of life is really important. If your quality of life is poor, you will not want to be alive. You will not want to face every day that you, that you, are, that you are given. And each day that you're given will feel like a burden instead of a blessing. And... It, it's totally like legit it's totally valid to feel like that if your quality of life is bad so prioritize your quality of life because it's really important it's actually the most important thing you have so you can do that by trying to identify what it is that's pulling your quality of life down if it's chronic pain we need to find a solution if it's social isolation we need to figure that out whatever it is whatever it is that's bringing your quality of life down we need to work on it from that and then loads of other things to come you know you've got your hormones you've got working on food sensitivities, you've got emotional root cause, you can look at mineral balancing, like there's a whole bunch of different stuff. You can do training, you can start working on becoming more athletic. There's a whole bunch of different things, right? But I really don't want to talk about them so much. I want to emphasize just how important these five things are. If you do these five things and you get these five things right, you're basically stacking the cards in your favor and it's statistically going to be difficult for you to not heal if you get these five things right. So prioritize these these things are really important you get these things right a lot of the other things will sort themselves out and if they don't tackle them then but focus on these things first hope you found this really helpful hope you found this really interesting and i hope you know how to triage 
your chronic health problems now. If you have any questions, do leave them below. I will get back to every single one. Take care. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.